My name's Aaron Ralston. My parents are Donald Larry Ralston of Englewood, Colorado. If you ever find this, please make an attempt to get it to them. That was the beginning of a video that Aaron Ralston recorded of himself as he accepted his fate to die alone in the desert canyons of Utah. What happens after this clip is a mystery, since it is the only portion of the video made available to the public. The rest of the tape kept hidden under lock and key in a safety deposit box deep in the vaults of a bank. What happened to Aaron that brought him to such a breaking point? And why was he out there all alone, where no one could find him? It all started when Aaron was only nine years old, when he read about an incident on Mount Everest. There, eight mountaineers lost their lives in the middle of a storm while attempting to scale the mountain. Aaron found himself wondering what he would do in such a situation and became interested in climbing himself. Of course, at the time, Aaron had no idea where his passion would lead him to be trapped in an absolute nightmare. In the nightmare that is staying safe on the internet, many of us have probably felt trapped into accepting that private personal information like your email address, home address, and phone number is available to whoever wants it without you knowing, let alone your consent. But now, thanks to this video's sponsor, Aura, we have a painless solution. Ever stumbled upon your own private details online where they shouldn't be? In today's world, data is a valuable asset, and data brokers trade your info with those pesky robocallers and spammers. They're legally required to remove your information if you ask them to, but make you jump through hoops, which is how Aura can help. Aura identifies where your information is being exposed and submit opt-out requests on your behalf so that you don't have to do all the legwork. Get an alert immediately when there's suspicious activity on any of your financial assets, online accounts, or personal data. Aura combines internet security app features like VPN, password management, antivirus, identity theft insurance, and more, all in one service so you don't have to pay for several different apps. Get a two-week free trial of Aura with our link in the description at aura.com brew. It's easy to set up, and once you do, it'll keep you and your family safe online. In 1997, Aaron graduated from Carnegie Mellon University with a double major in mechanical engineering and French, then took a job at Intel. Throughout his career at moves through Phoenix, Tacoma, and Albuquerque, he kept his love of rock climbing and even volunteered with a local search and rescue team. But as time went on, Aaron realized that he wanted to pursue his passions full time. In 2002, Aaron took the leap. As a first step, he moved to Aspen, Colorado and took a job at a local retail store Oot Mountaineering. He had a new goal, climb all of Colorado's 14ers, the 59 mountains in Colorado that are 14,000 feet or taller. Specifically, Aaron hoped to claim the unprecedented achievement of climbing all the 14ers both on his own and in winter. And as an extra accomplishment, he also reached the summit of 20,320 foot Mount McKinley, now known as Denali, by June of that year. Surprisingly, it wasn't during this dangerous expedition that Aaron had his first brush with death. It was months later when Aaron planned a backcountry skiing trip on Central Colorado's Resolution Peaks in February 2003. He guided two friends down the mountainside into a bowl, a broad open region on a slope without many trees. While this topographic feature is quite scenic, the bowl's shape can accumulate significant amounts of snow. While the three were gathered in a cluster of trees for a moment, a quiet woomph sounded out. The underwhelming sound was no amusing noise, however, but the unassuming ignition of a terrifying avalanche that swept them hundreds of feet down the mountain. Aaron was buried up to his neck, and one of his friends was buried completely. The remaining friend dug Aaron out, then together the two managed to rescue their friend from under the snow. In Aaron's own words, they shouldn't have survived, but they did, even if their friendship didn't. He had been the one to lead the three out there, after all. After a brush with their own mortality, some would have retired from the adventuring career, or at least taken a break from it. But in a mere three weeks, Aaron was already off on another trip. He had been planning a mountaineering expedition with some friends, but when it was called off, Aaron decided to make a last-minute trip instead, a spontaneous decision he would soon come to regret. Normally, Aaron didn't go anywhere without letting his roommates know exactly where he was going, and left a detailed schedule and itinerary behind, just in case. But this trip was so last minute that Aaron didn't have any plans beyond the one word he left behind, Utah. Aaron's impromptu trip was a five-day journey, during which he decided to travel through the Blue John and Horseshoe Canyons. Once he arrived, he decided to hit Blue John Canyon first. 
Once he got there, he locked up his bike and started to head in. On his way, Aaron ran into two women and the three got to talking. They became instant friends and the two invited Aaron along to have lunch with them. Had he said yes, things may have ended very differently, but Aaron had other plans. He wanted to get into the canyon. As Aaron climbed down the claustrophobic walls of the canyon, he came to a chalk stone, a fancy word meaning a rock wedged in a vertical rift that he could step onto and then drop onto the ledge beneath. Aaron kicked it to see if it would hold his weight, and when he was satisfied it would, he climbed onto it and dangled down. Then he felt it, rock scraping against rock, otherwise known as trouble. He dropped down, and when he looked up, he could only see the bus tire sized stone he had just been dangling from tumbling towards him. He couldn't move back thanks to a small ledge behind him, but there was no way to avoid what was coming next. The rock struck his left hand, but he was able to pull it away before he was too severely injured. But then it bounced and smashed into his right hand, pinning it against the canyon wall. The rock pulled it down another foot, crushing it between a rock and a hard place, quite literally. Aaron was trapped. Earlier in his life, Aaron had found inspiration in the John Krakauer books. Into the Wild was the story of Chris McCandless's life and tragic death, living alone in the wilderness of Alaska without money or any connection to the outside world. And Into Thin Air, a retelling of the 1996 Everest disaster that Krakauer himself was a part of. Aaron enjoyed the thought of living out of the back of a truck in the wilderness and wondered what he could do in such life-threatening situations. And now, Aaron would find out. His curiosity had become a horrifying reality. There, in the canyon, Aaron was stuck facing the rock that held his arm in place. He was stuck between two jagged canyon walls, feet firmly planted on the ground. And to make matters worse, he was alone. No one knew where he was, and he was panicking. First, Aaron tried to lift the boulder off of his hand, but it wouldn't budge. Then, the realization that he was thirsty set in, but Aaron's water pouch was already empty, and his other water bottle was in his backpack. The backpack that was currently slung over both his shoulders. Getting the strap off his left arm was easy enough, but his right arm proved to be more of a struggle. Obviously, getting it past the boulder wasn't an option, so he loosened the strap enough that he could fit it over his entire body then shifted through it with some awkward maneuvering. But after a short time, he'd done it. He had claimed his prize and got a taste of fresh water, then immediately drank a third of his water supply. Aaron managed to catch himself before it was too late and realized he had to calm down if he was going to make it through his ordeal. After taking a moment to inspect his situation, Aaron realized that he couldn't feel his right hand and that, from what he could see, it was already sickly gray. And if that weren't bad enough, his inventory wasn't exactly a wish list for someone trapped in a survival situation. In addition to the water in his bottle, he had some food, a CD player, some CDs, AA batteries, a camcorder, a digital camera, a headlamp, a multi-tool, some climbing rope, a harness, and some repelling equipment. But at least he had something to drink. Without water, average survival time in his conditions is somewhere between two and three days though that can drop as low as half a day for someone exerting themselves. Next, Aaron had to take inventory of his thoughts. His brain was racing with ways to escape. Some he discarded out of hand, like breaking open the AA batteries and using the acid to melt the boulder, but not his hand. Others he organized in order of preference. First, he could try to excavate the rock around his hand using his multi-tool. Second, he could try and rig ropes above him to lift the rock. Third, he could cut off his arm. He uh, chose to start with option number one. For five long hours, Aaron cut at the rock with the longer of the two knives in his multi-tool, but it wasn't working. Without a pick, he couldn't break the rock, and it was becoming clear that without a rigging system, his dreams of lifting the rock just weren't possible. You're gonna have to cut your arm off. But I don't want to cut my arm off. Aaron, you're gonna have to cut your arm off. Aaron stopped after he realized he was now arguing with himself, then continued cutting away at the rock despite it all. Hours stretched on, day turned to night, and around midnight, Aaron found himself unable to sleep, but decided he at least needed a way to sit down in order to conserve his energy. So Aaron climbed into his harness, then attached a rope to a carabiner, which he threw up at the rock face in the hopes of getting it to catch on something. After a dozen failed throws, it finally found a purchase giving him a chance to rest. Except, 
The harness was restricting his blood flow, too high a cost for some comfort, so he had to sit and stand in 20-minute shifts. Day two, Aaron shifted his attention from cutting the rock away to finding a way to make lifting the rock possible. He worked to set up an anchor that he could use for the rope. The process took two hours, but he managed it. Then, Aaron cut 30 feet of rope and tied it around the rock and added methods to gain more lift. But despite it all, the rock refused to move. Then, Aaron heard something. Voices. Help! He cried out for help, but no response came. Then, Aaron waited and listened and realized something horrible. They weren't voices. It was the sounds of a kangaroo rat in its nest. He was utterly alone. His mind turned back to cutting off his arm. He'd been using the long blade on his multi-tool to cut at the rock, which had dulled from the experience. But he also had a shorter, sharper blade that he could use. However, if he wanted to keep his blood inside, he was going to need a tourniquet to stem the bleeding. At first, Aaron tried to use the plastic hose from his water pouch, but it was too stiff and wouldn't tie around his arm tight enough. So instead, he used some webbing from his kit that seemed to do the trick. With a tourniquet ready, he went to start cutting, but just couldn't get past the mental block. Day three, Aaron's other attempts to escape had so far failed, and his mind turned back to amputation. As he mused on it, he realized that he wasn't confident in the tourniquet he had created, so he created something else. Taking the insulation from his camelback, Aaron found that it was a perfect candidate and used it instead. Then, he took his long knife the one he'd been using to stab the rock, and tried to cut his arm. Nothing, not even a drop of blood. Frustration set in, and Aaron gave up. Later that day, he prayed, and then offered a deal with the devil, just in case. Day four, Aaron went to take a drink from his last supplies of water, but dropped the bottle and spilled some. His morale was fading, but he started to wonder could the police use his credit card purchases to track him? He had bought some supplies on the way into Utah. It was possible that they might track him down. Except, he realized that he had paid cash. There were no records to track. And yet, somehow, Aaron managed to improve his morale. He spent time reminiscing about good times and bright memories. He took out his camcorder and, surprisingly rejuvenated, recorded a farewell message to his loved ones. My name's Aaron Ralston. My parents are down on Larry Ralston of Englewood, Colorado. If I ever find this, please make an attempt to get it to them. Be sure of it. I would appreciate it. Throughout the day, his gaze fell on his knife again. He suddenly knew what to do. He took the smaller, sharper blade and stabbed it into his arm. For a moment, he just inspected it, examining it, noticing he couldn't feel it under his skin. And then, he started to cut. He managed to get through most of the arm, but found that he couldn't break the bone, even with the sharper blade. Upon making this realization, he decided to take another drink and finish his water supplies. Day five. By now, the sleep deprivation was hitting Aaron hard. He was experiencing trances and visions. He had been awake for 96 hours now, and his mind was starting to wander onto less likely means of escape. One idea was to break the boulder open by using another rock as a wrecking ball. As the hours stretched on, he left more videos for his loved ones, detailing what he'd like done with his belongings, and asking his family to spread his ashes through different locations. A spot on the Rio Grande, Big Sur, Havasupai Creek. That night, he drifted into another trance. In this one, he walked through the canyon wall and into a living room. A child was there, his son, he picked up the kid and set him down on his shoulders. They danced and laughed, and Aaron balanced his son with his left hand and his right stump. Then, he was back in the canyon, but with a new motivation. He was determined to escape. Day six, it didn't last. Despite his motivation the night before, now Aaron's energy is gone. He viewed himself as a zombie, already gone, but still moving anyways. He picked up another rock then bashed the boulder with it. The zombie-like feeling wore away, replaced by an animalistic fury as he smashed the boulder until his hand burned with pain. Next, he took his dulled, long knife and began clearing the debris away from his right hand 
only to accidentally stab it with the blade. The knife that had failed to cut his skin mere days before now took a gash of skin away with it. Rotten skin. His hand had already begun rotting, its circulation cut off. Aaron took the knife and poked his right thumb with it and watched as gas started to escape. And then there was no more hesitation. Aaron wanted his arm gone. It wasn't his arm anymore. It was rotten garbage, trash to be thrown away. He lashed out. He was thrashing about, struggling, twisting, trying to break free, and then a bend. Feeling that unnatural bend, Aaron had a realization. He may not have been able to cut through his bone, but he could break his bone using a rock, a big one. The rock that was currently holding his arm down, in fact. Using it for torsion, he could finally be free. Aaron twisted and bent his arm until finally he hurt it. Pop, a pair of pops, like cap gun shots, rang out in the canyon. His bone was broken, and now he could finally escape. The horrifying experience of cutting away a rotting arm was euphoric to Aaron. After he had already given up and he had thought himself already lost, he had found a way to escape, to live. So he took it. Once his arm was gone, the hard part still loomed over him. He still had to get out of the canyon. He couldn't just easily climb down to the canyon floor after all. He had to rappel down instead. But first, he applied his makeshift tourniquet to hold the wound closed to make sure he had the chance to escape. Then, when he went to cast down a rope to the floor below, it slipped and he almost stranded himself. As the rope slid over the edge with a terrifying zzzz, Aaron managed to catch it with his foot at the last moment. From then on, Aaron kept telling himself, no stupid mistakes. He'd come this far. He had to make sure he got out. So he made sure his harness was double-backed, passing the harness strap through a buckle twice to secure it and make sure it wouldn't come loose on his descent and drop him to the ground below. Once it was secure, he hooked himself to the line and rappelled down. Finally, Aaron was free of the ledge that had been his prison for five long days. Now he was on the canyon floor, liberated from one ordeal, but in the midst of a new one, getting out of the canyon. First, he had to figure out the correct direction to travel in order to actually escape the canyon. But even once he had determined that, there was another problem. The moment he had severed his arm, a countdown timer had begun, ticking ever closer to zero with every drop of blood he lost. His makeshift tourniquet had sufficed so far, but he was still in danger of losing too much blood to even make it to medical support. And yet, Aaron pushed on. Somehow, wounded as he was, Aaron managed to scale the 65-foot canyon wall and reach the ground above. But Aaron was thirsty, and the harsh light of the sun must have made the walk even more unbearable than the blood loss was. But on his way, he had a stroke of good fortune. As he stumbled forwards, away from the canyon and through the boiling heat of the sun, the countdown timer ticked ever closer to the moment he had lost too much blood to keep going. But as he wandered, he came across an unexpected salvation. Aaron had stumbled into a family of three Dutch tourists who, understandably, were concerned about the dazed man bleeding and missing an arm. The three gave him food and water, and while the mother and son went to get help from the authorities, the father stayed with Aaron until a search and rescue helicopter arrived. His family, worried after such a long absence, had raised the alarm and started a search for the mountaineer. Now, finally, Aaron had found salvation. As medics evacuated him from the area, Aaron realized that he likely amputated his arm at the perfect time, any earlier, and he would have bled out, any later, and he might not have had the strength to make it out of the canyon. Three days later, park officials later returned to the site of Aaron's grueling experience and managed to retrieve his arm. It took a small army to free the limb, 13 park rangers, a winch, and a hydraulic jack. The boulder was difficult to dislodge. It was 800 pounds and wedged firmly in the canyon. But finally, the boulder was moved, wedged into another secure spot, and the part that Aaron left behind was returned to him. The arm was cremated, and Aaron later scattered the ashes back in the canyon that had taken it from him. The dream that provided Aaron with a renewed sense of hope later came true. Not only is Aaron a father now, but he also managed to fulfill his earlier dream. In 2004, Aaron published a book on his ordeal, 
Then, in 2005, Aaron completed his goal of climbing all of Colorado's 14ers in the snow with a new prosthetic arm. Aaron's story was also adapted into the 2010 film 127 Hours from the director of Slumdog Millionaire, Danny Boyle. He had become a story like the ones he idolized growing up. Aaron's story is a harrowing one, and it's impressive that he held on through the worst of times and managed to fight, climb, and crawl back to civilization even after giving up. And while Aaron's story is inspiring, I for one am content not finding out whether I have what it takes to survive. We always make choices of what we want in our lives, so for some reason I had wanted that experience. What would I do if I were in a situation where my life was on the line? Oh, you really wanted to know? Well here, you're gonna find out, Aaron.